Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome you all on this, I hope, at least interesting presentation uh, about, um, generally speaking, drones, and um, more specific about the works which we have done uh, in our uh, laboratory in, in Krakow. And my name is Hubert Scholz, and I came here to you, as I said, from the Krakow, from the AGH University. Uh, I will say a few words about the university soon. Uh, before we start, uh, I have a small gift for you uh, from Poland, uh, some chocolates. Uh, it's called Ptasie Mleczko in Polish language. Uh, directly uh, translating, it would be the bird's milk or something like that, but don't, no worries. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it tastes better than, than uh, sounds. <laughs> uh, basically, it's uh, like vanilla marshmallow inside the dark chocolate, so it should be good for you. So I can Thank move you. it and <laughs> at least to it. Uh, if you want to eat everything now, then then I think we'll leave it in this social room. So yeah, yeah. so to access forever. All right. So moving directly to the topics today, what I would like to tell you, first of all, because I know that drones is drones generally are not your primary research topic, and probably not also secondary research topic. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, I I decided to do some gentle introduction uh, at the beginning. Uh, later on, we will move on to the autonomous flight. Uh, how we can do it? What are our main challenges in this area? And then what, what we did and what we would like to do in the future in this area. But before about drones, a few words about my home university. It is uh, AGU University of Krakow. And here on the, on the left, uh, left image, you can see our main and the oldest building, the building A0. So definitely it, 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 it was named by some programmer because he started from, from zero. Uh, our, our motto uh, in Latin is labore creata labore et scientia servio, uh, which in English means that uh, I was created by labor, so I serve labor and the science. And let's assume that that's what we are doing. Uh, we have approximately 20,000 students of course, it's not a constant value. Um, last year we have we had something about nineteen thousand. Two years ago, twenty one thousand. So it's very, but approximately twenty thousand, and includes that uh, one thousand peer students, one of them here, uh, from this one thousand, and about staff. Uh, at total, we have more than four thousand. Uh, four thousand people as working as a staff uh, and in this number 2020 are academics. Uh, also uh, in AGH we have 17 faculties uh, including for example faculty uh, for humanities or of humanities so we are in fact a multidisciplinary university but we are known mainly for our uh, engineering stuff so we are based in this direction. Also, if you have never been in Krakow, uh, you should visit the city. Uh, very nice, beautiful city with uh, fantastic heritage. One of the um, most, I believe, beautiful cities in Poland. So definitely, I recommend that. Our research group, uh, Embedded Vision Systems Group, uh, you can see quite complicated hierarchy in our university. Uh, we are uh, working on the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Automatics, and so on, and so on, so on. quite quite long number, uh, quite quite long name. Uh, apparently, the longest name on our universities. Yeah. Uh, inside this faculty, we have Department of Automatic Control and Robotics, their Computer Vision, Vision Laboratory, and finally our our group. Uh, the head of our group is Professor Marek Gordon, who is also. Uh, at the moment, a vice director for science. So we should, um, maybe in most of the time, we have to be self organized because of that. <laughs> <laughs> in our group, we have three PhDs and a PhD student, so 11 people uh, at all. And what is, I think, interesting, uh, we have 
our student research group called Avadar. Uh, uh, yeah, quite similar for you, I believe. But it's coincidence. We didn't know about it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I mentioned about it because uh, we have fantastic students and most of their work, uh, which uh, they are doing here in our student research group, we can then use and uh, you know get something from there for, for us on our in our research. So this is very good cooperation with them. All right, <clears throat> I think that's enough. Uh, introduction about uh, our group. Now let's move to drones. Uh, first of all, very basic thing, uh, how drone flies. In fact, uh, ah, this is, I think, a good remark at the beginning that uh, when I think about drones, I think about uh, multi-rotors, basically, because we have many types of drones, but we are focusing mainly on these uh, multi-rotors, so I'll stick to that. Drones, multi-rotors. So uh, in this case, multi-rotors fly because of the propellers or rotors. Uh, the fun fact uh, is that these rotors are rotating in different directions just to compensate the overall torque, which is generated in, in this drone. And we would like to fly in some direction, then we just need to uh, unbalance this torque. The drone will change its attitude and move in some direction. No magic, pure science, but if we will, but if we want to describe it uh, in a more mathematical way, create some mathematical model, then we will end up with very complicated nonlinear model, which is very messy and hard to, hard to work with. But some people do that. What we have on such drones, uh, first of all, we have, of course, our propellers, which are, which are here and are controlled by the, uh, by the ESC propellers. Uh, in the core part, uh, the most important thing uh, are things, are these two components. We have flight controller, which is like a low-level controller uh, responsible for generating the uh, direct control signals. And we have also the onboard computer, which serves the purpose of the high-level controller. And this is this, this onboard computer is our main focus here. We are dealing with, with, with that. Uh, there are many flight controllers, these low-level controllers on the market. So we can choose one and work with, work with that. It's already like on the shelf. And more about it. Uh, as I said, flight controller uh, is used for the direct thrust control, but also it can it can have some embedded algorithms, uh, like to perform some basic maneuvers. Uh, for example, hoover. Hoover is a maneuver when uh, drone drone fly and stand at one point. So it's a, like hoover. Uh, also. Uh, this basic algorithms uh, can be like fly to point or, or fly to straight line through some arc, just basic things. Also, here we have some fusion uh, of data from different sensors, like IMU. IMU is inertial measurement unit. So it's uh, for measure the acceleration and things like that, cost of barometer, et cetera. At this high level, however, um, we are using embedded platforms like NVIDIA, uh, Jetson, for example, like Raspberry, or some FPGA devices we can use here at this high level. And this is the, uh, I would say, the, the brain of our drone, this, this high level controller. Yes, as I said, this flight controller uh, can be purchased off the shelf uh, with some integrating sensors like alien and so on. Also here, we have special dedicated software for this flight level controllers, uh, which are uh, mainly open source. So we can use it, uh, we can uh, modify them like to serve the best for us. And as I said before, these onboard computers uh, like, like FPGAs and so on. Uh, the very important thing here is that uh, these embedded platforms uh, have to be 
at low power consumption because power is a very limited resource on our drone. We have only small accumulator for for the purpose, small small battery, uh, which serve the purpose of of uh, give the power for the uh, our drone and and propellers are relatively very high power have relatively high power power consumption. All right. <clears throat> If you would like to fly the drone autonomously, which means that uh, we do not operate the drone, just you know switch it switch it on and do everything what you want, but do it yourself. Uh, then we have many challenges here. First of all, something which I call the structural instability, uh, which means that without power uh, we are losing all control of it and. It, you know, when you are driving a car like Tesla, it, it will stop some, some hope, yeah? But the drone will not stop, <laughs> it will crash. And this is a very, very important issue here. Uh, drone has many degrees of freedom, in fact, six degrees of freedom, which means that we can fly in, independently in each direction and also rotate it in each direction. So many possibilities, but with great uh, possibilities also come the great responsibility for that. Uh, as I said before, complicated, highly non-linear mathematical model. Uh, and also, drones are generally very sensitive to the surrounding environment. Yes, for, they are very sensitive to the wind, for example, uh, or when it rain, when, when you have rain, that it, it also can affect our, our drone. Yeah. And I have for you a short video to show you that uh, sometimes it is, it is very hard to fly the drone manually. Maybe I will enlarge the window. Oh no, you don't come, oh, yes. But it's, mm. it's very slow. Maybe better because you will see the results of the landing code. But, oh no, <laughs> why? <laughs> oh no, wait a second. Maybe I will. Might be because before because we are going through Zoom and then... uh, maybe because in my laptop everything works fine. Yeah, I think it's the Zoom latency. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So this is maybe I will show you the the, the end of that. What? Yeah, just unintentional flip. Uh, so we we are. We need to be aware of that. Okay, wait a second, because I lost my screen for a moment. All right. This short clip was also the source material for the mem, which I prepared for, for our meeting today. Uh, yeah, this is our drone here, which is doing this <laughs> thing. We need to be aware of that, so that some things can happen. Uh, but we can still try to manage to fly uh, in the autonomous mode. Uh, and in most uh, works, uh, it is divided into three parts. So first of all, we need to plan where we would like to go. And this part is called the trajectory planning. So basically, we uh, create some director, uh, some trajectory, which we then try to follow. And this is the second part. Uh, of course, during this following, uh, we can end it up with some new circumstances, new circumstances, new objects around us. So we have to uh, actualize our trajectory during this flight. Uh, to measure somehow how our uh, drone fly, if, if, it, if it flies good or not good, uh, we have two most popular test cases, at least nowadays. Uh, first of, of them is the fly through the predefined gates track. And uh, to some extent, it is uh, scalable to the drone racing. This is some nowadays sport, maybe, uh, in which uh, drones are flying through the same track and the fastest one, of course, win uh, the prize or something like that. And the second uh, test case is, the, is flying through the previously unknown environment. So, for example, I'm starting at the end of this corridor. 
I don't know this environment and, and I'm trying to navigate through this environment, for example, to find someone, something, or to map the environment. Okay, so that's two cases. And speaking about first cases, first case, uh, we had one work about it. Uh, in this work, uh, the main goal was to fly with this drone, this is DJI Tello quadcopter, very small, uh, very affordable uh, drone, uh, very good to learn because very hard to make some harm with, 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 with it. Uh, also, we created the gates with this small Aruko tag here. This Aruko tag is very important because it facilitates the navigation of the drone. We, uh, we would like to have only vision-based navigation, so therefore, uh, it's not visible here, but at the front of the drone, there is a small cam camera here. Uh, small camera. Uh, we can uh, get the video stream from, from this camera, and process them, and uh, detect the Aruko tag and, and the, the whole gate, so we know where to fly. Uh, we compared two strategies here. Uh, first one was uh, divided into five steps, but in fact, uh, it was two main steps here. First of all, the drone uh, had to find the Aruko tag, navigate towards this, this Aruko tag, and then move to the center line and fly through the gates. Uh, the second part was slightly modified, uh, and in this case, the steps, I think, one, two, three, was combined as one step, which was the flying through the uh, center line and fly through the, through the gates. And I have another video, I hope this time it will play smoothly, about our work. Let's see. Okay, what's going on? Here you will have also some more details about our work, but the most valuable part uh, is the uh, short video which in which comparison of these two trajectories, uh, two, two approaches are provided, but, uh, but we must wait for this part. Uh, maybe, as, as it is claimed, um, this Aruko tag, as you can see, um, has special, it's, it's something like a QR code, in fact. It's very easy to detect it, and that's why it's very, uh, very nice to use it in, in such a work. Yes, here you can see these five steps of the first control strategy, uh, and so it will be the, uh, also the, the same description of the second control strategy. And it's worth mentioning here that this is the work uh, which we did in cooperation with, uh, with, with one of our students uh, who was working in, with this, in this uh, student research uh, group, Avada. So this is one, one example of uh, how we can cooperate with students. Oh, and now we will have this comparison. And of course, second control strategy. It's quite faster in this case. Also, uh, this is the recording from home of our student because it was uh, during the pandemic time. So <laughs> that's why uh, such peculiar environment for this. <laughs> but yep, it worked. So, so that was a good achievement, I would say. Oh, come on. Okay, so we will do that this way. Okay, the second work. Uh, this work uh, was intended to explore the second test case, which which is the flying through unknown environment. And in this situation, we uh, have the unknown environment, uh, which we call the forest. So this is the forest, which you don't see. Uh, this is the forest from 2D perspective, from, from this third flight perspective. Here, red, blue, brown circles are our trees. Here, are, here, here is our drone. And this 
lines, which are quite uh, blurred here on this image. Uh, this is the beams of LiDAR. This is a LiDAR sensor, which we use to uh, gain some knowledge about, about the environment. This is a very uh, simple um, environment, but we use it to learn uh, our algorithm, by uh, our agent, uh, in means of the reinforcement learning algorithm here. Uh, later on, we verified it in this maybe more sophisticated uh, environment using the Gazebo simulator. Uh, and at the last step, we deployed it uh, into the uh, drill drone and try to fly it, uh, fly, to try to fly inside the uh, real forest. I will show you later. <laughs> no, it's, it, it was even, I would say, relatively good. So, <laughs> but before that, uh, we trained our agents uh, using the stable baseline three library. Uh, with the NVIDIA GeForce RTX uh, GPU. Uh, the training was really good because we achieved the highest uh, accuracy, about 91%. So not, not, not bad, <laughs> but in the real world, it was quite lower accuracy. Uh, ah, uh, maybe it, it is worth mentioning here that the main goal was to fly on the predefined distance because with this work, uh, we will try to participate in some contest uh, organized by the uh, research group from the Zurich. And their, this research group is one of the best in this, in this topic. That, that, that's why we tried to um, participate in this contest. Uh, we participated, then we took the third place. I believe so, but not bad, but only five groups participate. So. <laughs> but we were afraid. Okay, uh, that's that's the main outcome. And I have short video how this drone slide. Ah, oh, you can see this is our basic simu simulator uh, right in the uh, Python language. So. Not, not very sophisticated. Later, this test in Gazebo with, well, because now I have some issues with my internet connection, I believe. Maybe I will stop for a moment and let it download. Uh, again, it's not very, I, I would say, Similar, this environment is not, not very similar to the real environment because it doesn't look like a forest. But uh, in case of LiDAR, uh, it was enough to train drone. If we would like to use camera, for example, then we gonna need some better uh, environment here to, you know, to, uh, to simulate the reality. Okay. It is going, so it's not bad. As you can see in, in this simulation, it can go around these trees, so everything seems to be good. Of course, here is also some assumption about that we don't have so many um, in this tree, so many um, branches, <laughs> I would say that way. Uh, we are flying in this lower part where we have only one, one pillar. Okay. And now the real forest. Here is our drone. It will be back on the image soon. No worries. Okay. Here is in the middle part of the image. And unfortunately, it's not very smooth. <laughs> Here is everything okay. Yeah. Switch to the HDMI field. Mm, okay. Yeah, it's still the HDMI from the, it's the white cable. White cable here. The other side. Yeah. <laughs> here. Yes, here. Okay. So maybe better that way. Yep.
Okay. I think it is better now. Yes. Slide. Uh, I will give you some results after this after this short video. So. Because of course here uh, I'm showing only these good examples of <laughs> <laughs> only good tests, but uh, it wasn't that bad. During the training process, we add the to 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 the reward function also some values in to 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 penalize to um, to to penalize when when drone was flying too far from the straight line and therefore after uh, after it uh, flying near the tree it, it tries to go back to this straight straight line. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Maybe I will move to the next slide directly. Yeah, to sum up the results, uh, we did uh, in total 25 flights. 13 of them was very good without I mean, collisions. Uh, in seven flights, uh, it, hit the, it hit, hit the tree, but fly, fly, co continues fly after that. Uh, in five cases, it was quite very crushed. So. <laughs> um, but um, in general, we can say that 80% was relatively good. Okay. So, yeah, but uh, as you can see, this is, it is very um, different to fly in simulator and to, in, in reality. And even in the, liter in the literature, there is the term uh, sim to real gap. And this is a very, very big issue now. And many researchers tries, try to um, somehow remove this gap, but it's a long, long way to go here. All right. Uh, to sum up my presentation, uh, I can say that we are still far, far away for, from the fully autonomous UAV, and maybe that's good in some ways because you know, there are many, many possible uh, use cases for the UAV. And not all of them are very peaceful. Yes, so <laughs> maybe it's better that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the classic approaches, um, we need to deal with this very complicated theory, mathematical model, and so on. So it's not very, uh, very nice approach. But yeah, still we can do that. Also, we can use more sophisticated approaches than a simple heuristic approach, which we used. Uh, we can use some optimal control theory and try to fly in the time optimal way, but it's very much more complicated. Uh, in, when, when we try to train, learn the, uh, the agent how to, how to fly with drone, uh, the most common approach nowadays is to use the some reinforcement learning based solutions, but uh, we would like to try for that matter also the TPGs. So that's why I'm here. Um, we will see. Um, at least at the beginning, we will try. We, we, we would like to try with some basic environments, maybe like with this one, which we used for for our lidar based uh, flight. And later on, we will see how, in which way it will it will go. 
Okay, so thank you very much for, for listening to me. If you want some more info, we have Facebook, we have LinkedIn. So we, we, we are uh, in social media as well. So. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Yep. Um, do you know what is the limitation? Uh, uh, what is what the limitation going from a simulated environment to the real one? Is it because the simulation is too simplistic, or is there other things? It's I think two 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 main reasons for for that. First is the simplistic in simulation. We it's really hard to. Uh, model the graphical in, in, in this graphical simulation the, to model the reality, the complexity of real world objects. Nowadays, we of course have more opportunities. We we have some something like even metaverse from Facebook or, or, or Omniverse. So this is one direction. But if if it work, I don't know. We will see. Uh, and the second. I think uh, is the is related to the physics and to the modeling of mathematical things here, and because of course uh, each model uh, has its own uh, simplicity, has its own um, I would say uh, changes in relation to the real world. So we cannot model the real world effects like, like one to one. Yes. There's also some gaps here. So I think this is two reasons for this sim to gap. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so there is a gap between uh, sim yeah. uh, simulation and the reality. Do you think it would be possible to do some kind of fine tuning? So I know it's kind of maybe it's costly because you don't want to crash any, uh, any time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, also, uh, maybe it would be possible, uh, like uh, you show a drone uh, uh, that has a sort of cage, mm -hmm. so maybe it is more robust, and maybe it could be useful to learn something in a real environment and to transfer this to a drone that is more fragile. Yes, we well. exactly. We thought about it, and even we are currently currently building such a, I would say, safe environment to do such a thing uh, with cameras <coughs> to do the motion capture system here, and we'll see. Uh, the base case which we assume here is that we will learn some basic movements in simulation and later on we will go to this safe environment and try to learn it, fine tune in this safe environment. But at the moment I don't know any other uh, works in, the, in this direction. I suppose that especially in uh, business cases, uh, they are trying to use that, but in research fields in academia, I don't know such works, uh, such, such, such works. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, um, in your, your uh, model, uh, your PEO model, your agent is your drone? Or... Yes, the agent is the control uh, algorithm of my drone. So okay, the, so when you change drone, you have to change, or or maybe it's a multi-agent uh, model PO or oh, it it it, it depends uh, because each model, uh, it, each drone has its own uh, physical constraints. Yes, so when we are trying to teach our agent to fly with one specific kind of drone with its own mass, with its own inertia, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, then moving to the Another drone could be uh, hard because of these changes in, in, in physical parameters. Okay. okay. Did you try the different uh, algorithm, such as, I don't know, like t or? Not at the moment. We tried only this PPO yeah. algorithm, uh, but uh, we would like also to try the uh, soft actor critic yeah. for, for that case, okay. especially in. The variable environments where these yes. things can vary. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of chip did you add on the road going through the, through the forest? It was the NVIDIA that's on uh, mounted on this drone. And uh, what, what was the, the load uh, 
What was the occupancy? Okay. Oh, that's a good question because I don't remember at the moment. But uh, I will check it, okay? And I will give you some background, some, some info later on, okay? And, um, so on the, on the 3D simulation that you showed, mm -hmm. um, we saw that uh, when the, uh, yes, yes, this one, yeah. That when the, the door uh, shifts to like uh, about the three or anything, uh, it's, it looks like the radar, um, it's like uh, the rays that are projected are on a disk. Mm -hmm. uh, but so when the drone uh, shift to our direction, uh, the ray will not be shifted uh, horizontally. Uh, in the, yes. uh, do you think it would be a problem uh, because it can change the uh, mm -hmm. position of the distance between the trees? Or... Yes, it's one of these differences between simulation and reality in, in this case. Uh, what is worth mentioning here is that this LiDAR here is the 2D LiDAR, so it only scans in one uh, one plane. To, we, we can, for example, substitute this 2D LiDAR by the 3D LiDAR, which is scanning the whole, um, the, the whole space. And in this case, it won't be an issue anymore. But here, I agree that it could be one of the issues here, which, uh, which is related to these different results in simulation and reality. Mm -hmm. Yes. Have a question. Uh, so just uh, for continuing on this. Okay. So your model of the environment is 3D, it's, or it's or it's not 2D. You take into account. Uh, yes, it's it's basically 2D without <laughs> modeling this 3D. Uh, you are not model, even in the environment. No. 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 Okay. No, no. Okay. Here, here okay. The, that's your yeah, that's your model. Okay. It's playing 2D. Here we have this 3D, mm -hmm. so we can verify uh, if. Uh, learning basically only on 2D, we can then fly in 3D mm -hmm. with this with this second environment. Yes, we can. And what would be nice would be to learn from the real uh, drone in a synthetic environment. Mm -hmm. But that so you get the real physics of the drone, and then you can play with many uh, simulated environment. But mm -hmm. so yes, it's one of the idea to extend this work. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Um, because if we think about this drone here in this more sophisticated environment, this drone uh, has its physical model um, more sophisticated and mm -hmm. more likely the more like the real drone. So here in this second environment, uh, we can do much more things, mm -hmm. um, and this is the place where we would like to also um, do some future work about it. Okay, but could you, for instance, have a real drone and uh, input some uh, synthetic data of uh, LiDAR? Yes, yes, we can we can do that. Uh, and uh, at the moment, we didn't do that, but in some works, mm -hmm. they did that. Okay. And they claim that uh, it increased their performance. So mm -hmm. it's undoubtedly a very good direction for the future work here also. And you want to keep LiDAR or go to... No, we would like to go to, to camera, okay. vision-based, uh, also with uh, dynamic vision sensors with these event cameras. I don't know if you heard about it, but this is some kind of the new camera sensor in which uh, we don't have the entire scene like in normal camera, but we are uh, recorded only the, 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 the changes. In oh, yeah. the, the very, very sophisticated uh, and interesting chip. Uh, and we will try to do something with, with it also. Mm 